It's obviously very cold outside, so thank you for the building. Hopefully your home, homes are nice and warm too. But thank you for, for making the venture out tonight. Appreciate you being here. I think we'll begin tonight with a prayer. So are there any specific prayer requests before we start our class tonight? Anybody we need to keep? I know Linda Koss has uh, been quite sick. I think Randy had to take her in today. So any, any update on? Candy's family. She's home. Back home uh, where she should be home by now. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, Okay. So okay, she's back home. And keep Candy in your prayers, yeah, with the, with the loss of her mother. Uh, certainly want to remember her. Keep Roger in your prayers. Roger? She's going through a lot of heart tests right now. So. Okay. A lot of heart tests for Roger, so we'll keep Roger in our prayers, too. Um, we had a nice time at camp. Uh, a few people in here that were there. It was Camp was interesting. There were a lot of people that got stuck in the snow and flat tires and all kinds of stuff, but uh, the fellowship part was good, and uh, it was nice to be able to get away for a few days and, and then come back and not have to go to school. That was kind of nice. So, yeah. Um, Keith Johnson is also having a surgery. Keith in Johnson. Right? He's okay. going to have to be in the hospital for a couple of nights, so he's worried about Linda. Okay. So we need to be praying for Linda. Okay. Too. You didn't hear that? Keith Johnson uh, is going to be away for a little bit with some tests, and so he's concerned about Linda and, uh, while he's away, and we want to remember them certainly in our prayers too. Pam? Um, Mr. Fiore, Sam's dad, yes. uh, went to the hospital today. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, Anything I, specific or he's just, uh, just not feeling like well? Chest pains. Chest pains? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Fiore, Sam's, Sam's dad, if you yeah. remember him too. Thank you. All right. Okay. I don't know if I can remember all that, but I'll just I'll say it. Yeah, go ahead, Sonia. Um, one of my workers, their, uh, their grandpa was put in hospice care. One of your coworkers? Yeah, one grandparents? of your coworkers. Grandparents? Oh, okay. Anybody else? Okay. All right, well, let's, let's start with a prayer tonight. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to, to be here this evening. We're thankful for the, the, the warmth of the building, but thankful for the, the body. We're thankful for the people that are here tonight um, to make the time. and to, It's cold, and it does take effort to get here, and we're, we're thankful for all who have chosen to, to do so. We're mindful of, of those that have been mentioned tonight. We know that uh, Candy Lance is hurting. And, we pray for her family and as she grieves the loss of her mother. Um, we continue to pray for, for Roger. Uh, we pray for Mr. Fiore. Uh, we pray for Sonda's, Sonia's co-worker um, and her, um, her grandparent who's, who's struggling. We're praying for um, comfort there. Father, we ask that you will um, continue to be with, um, with us in the weeks ahead. And we're thankful for our time here. We're thankful that we can we can pause and we look forward to our class today and uh, there are others too that, that slip or escape our minds and we know that you know each and every need and uh, we, we pray that you will um, help us to reach out and to spend time in prayer on an individual level as well as we remember those with a call or a card and, uh, just to keep them in our mind we thank you for the opportunity to study tonight and through Jesus we pray amen all right, so last week we talked about the parable of the prodigal son. And so the proximity of where these parables are, Luke 15, you've got the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son or prodigal son. So they're all together, not really surprising when you're keeping in context what's happening in the passage and who Jesus is with. But uh, we, we find that these are very similar stories. And so one of the things... Thank you, Jim. Um, So last week we talked about, I I know that we focused predominantly on the story of the prodigal son. But if there's 99 sheep, and one of those sheep happens to go astray or is lost, it's it's wonderful to have 99 that are safe. But if you do lose one, does that one lost sheep have have value? And we said yes, because the, the parable makes that abundantly clear, that there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents, right, than 99 who don't need to. So that one lost sheep, even though it's one out of a hundred, has value. Same thing seems to be true with the parable of the lost coin, right? The lost coin makes the the necklace or maybe the wedding jewelry incomplete. You still have nine coins, but that one coin completes everything, right? And there's value in finding it. It's a celebratory thing to have relocated it. 
And then the same holds true with the story of the prodigal son. Right? You have the one son that stayed home and did what his father wanted him to do, right? But it's that son at the end that seems to have missed it. So there is value in someone coming back to the Lord, making that move or that change to repent and come back. And that's the story we have with the prodigal son. Okay, so tonight the parable of the, the ten minas, or minas, however you want to pronounce it, but I think it's, Dave and I were talking, we think it's, we think it's na, right, in the, in the lexicon, like the original Greek, so it's mina, I believe, but I've, I've seen both. So we'll go with that. You'll know what I'm talking about either way. So what is a mina? Well, it sounds like it's about three months' wages, so around 100 days. So it sounds to me like it's a very small amount of money, but it would, that's what it equates to, about three months' wages. So we've got, again, we're going to look at the context for this parable being told, and then also look at, so, so what's the context for it? And it's a parable about money use. So we're going to look at this closely. We're going to break it down by sections, hopefully make some, some headway with this, and then hopefully some application for ourselves. Okay, okay did you know? <laughs> the Rolling Stones. No, there's not a song this time. Last week I told you there was a song for the prodigal son. There's, the Rolling Stones did not make a song about the ten minutes. I wish they had, because that would be just perfect. Because those are the two that Russ gave me, and I would have had back-to-back weeks. So there's no song this week. There's no lyrics to pass out. But did anybody go home and listen to that song yeah. last week? Yeah? What did you think? Uh, well, I found the original one. It was yeah. a little better. You like the original one better? Yeah. yeah. Those stones got a little uh, diabolic twist to them all the time. You know? <laughs> First but, you, was okay. but you listen to the lyrics, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the original one was, was a lot longer. Than it's longer. Stones did. Yep. So no, no music, a little teaser this time. But responsibility. The comedian Jerry Seinfeld always made the joke that um, why would anyone ever want to be responsible? Right? Because whenever something goes wrong, the first thing they ask is, well, who's responsible for this? And you're like, I don't, I don't want to be responsible for but responsibility is something, it's a, it's a part of life. Um, it comes with the territory. It comes with moving out of adolescence into adulthood. And so responsibility is, is a part of life. Um, and so I know that I have responsibilities. You have responsibilities. When you think about being entrusted with something, so to an extent, we could all say, yeah, we've been entrusted or had something in our care or keeping. But can you think of some, a time maybe when you were younger maybe uh, adolescence, maybe early adulthood, any time really where somebody left something, an object, a pet maybe, child in your care, where you're entr entrusted with someone's precious cargo, the children. What is, what is that kind of responsibility like? Do you put a lot of thought into it? Are you nervous? Right. I, I, I remember being... Um, I'm always nervous to hold somebody else's child when they're an infant, right? I'm like, I should probably sit down, right? They're putting, I'm holding that child. When it was my child, I was the same way. But I think when it's somebody else's, I, I think maybe I'm even more, more careful, right? Don't drop the child. Can you think of anything that you've been entrusted with and you felt maybe the weight of that responsibility? Yeah, Judy. I had a, a <clears throat> well, both my brothers were in the military. But one of my brothers had been living stateside, and then he got shipped overseas, and he left us with his van to sell. And it was like, oh. what a pain that was. <laughs> First I thought, oh, yeah, we'll be glad to take care of you. What a nightmare that turned into. So it became a little bit of a burden, oh, yeah. you could say. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Right. Anything else? Yeah, Butchie. This is sort of kind of funny, but mm -hmm. uh, my uncle, great uncle, owned a funeral home. Yes. And... Um, down south, and uh, back in the day, the ambulance and the hearse was twofold. So when you need to go to the uh, hospital, you could call the funeral home, they'd go take the ambulance and take you to the hospital. Well, there had been um, a lady at, um, that had an accident, and she was very um, torn up, you know, and the rule was in Tennessee, you can't leave anyone, in, you know, that's been in, that has passed alone in the, in the, what do you call it, funeral home. And so my uncle and my grandmother had to make a run to take someone to the hospital to make, you know, to have, they were having a heart attack. So they left me in charge. I think I was 12, 12, yeah. 
and um, I had been there before, but it hadn't bothered me. Mm -hmm. But this lady had to have an extensive makeup because she, you know, had been in a bad accident. And the ladies came in and they wanted to go and they signed the registry. They went in and there was a it signed there and it says, please turn off the light after viewing. They forgot. And so they left and I had to go and turn off the light, turn off the light. And because of that light, I looked at her and it seems that there were beads of sweat on her face. And the longer I stood there, the more I thought I saw her breathing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you oh, know? man. Yeah. And so, um, yeah, uh, when they got back, I was in the middle of the street waiting for them. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. that, it was I don't know if I'd want to be responsible for that either. <laughs> I, don't, I think I'd rather pass that on to somebody. Uh, anything else? Anybody uh, in charge of watching someone's pet for an extended period? And anything like that? Never found him. Oh. <laughs> they were gone for like a week, and I was over there every day setting little traps, trying to figure if we could trap him somehow. If it, we never knew what happened to him. I don't know if he climbed up in a wall or whatever. When they got back, we were like, oh, So that happened on your watch, right? And you were like, ah. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. That was a boy I liked. So yeah. Oh, okay. I wasn't really happy with him. Okay. After that. Yeah. They, they eventually forgave you, though, right? I mean, no. No? Okay. <laughs> no. Anybody else? Pam? Well, when my dad, uh, as he was getting older, and we each took turns staying with him and watching him, and we all were just like, uh, nothing's going to happen on our watch, you know, when we were there, when it was our turn. So I'm not saying that any, anything did, but it was, <coughs> like, I always felt like it was a great responsibility, you know. That time it was like, okay, it's your turn, you know, to mm -hmm. be yeah. my dad. Yeah, that's good. I know that, um, I know that my dad has left uh, my, my brother, um, and me, a, a, with the responsibility to take care of the lawns while he's gone, and I know we've we've done that before. And um, I don't remember there. Uh, there was one incident where I, I think I thought the trailer was on the hitch and it, and it wasn't maybe locked, but then we realized it. But nothing happened, so I think we we, we worked it out. Um, but we've also had uh, we've also sorry to bring that up. We've also had angry customers that uh, questioned us like, "Who are you guys?" And like, "Oh, we're." here to cut your lawn. We're, we're Bill's sons. Well, he's, where's he? I'm like, well, he's out of town. So we're going to, well, I don't want you to, so he kind of shooed us away and we were like, all right, well, we, we did, we did our due diligence. We showed up, we tried to reason with him, but, um, but usually, usually that works out okay. But that's, there's a responsibility there. If I'm honest, that always made me a little uncomfortable and just like, you know, well, what if this goes wrong or what if the, the trailer does come off, or what if the, you know, just all the things that you think of, you're, you're responsible for taking care of these 25 people that expect you to show up, and, um, but yeah, there, there's a weight to that. My mom had a responsibility to keep an eye on her son, and she, and she left me at two garage sales, I'm just saying. Eventually, <laughs> 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 though, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. You turned out great. There you go. Okay, so um, the word entrusted, so if you look up uh, in the dictionary the word, the word entrust means to give a task, duty, or responsibility to. So the word trust is actually embedded in the middle of that. So when you talk about synonyms, right, like when this, this parable that we're about to read and there's, a, there's going to be a, a task that's given to some of the servants, right? And so some of the words, like to task someone with something, to recommend someone for something, uh, to assign something, or to charge someone with a task, for example. So all these words are very similar, but the word entrust, right, has that sense of like, I'm trusting you to do this. So I, I think I like that word the best out of all of them. But there's a responsibility that some of these servants in this text are going to be given. So a little context for this before we read it. So this is, uh, now, this is not completely different than um, the parable of the talents, which I think is in Matthew. So this is going to sound very similar. Uh, in fact, I kind of was like, oh, yeah, these are, there's a lot going on, but there's a little different element to this one. But in the context of chapter 19, it's talking about Zacchaeus. Um, I'll give you the short version. 
Okay. Sorry. That joke killed at camp. But anyway. Uh, Zacchaeus' conversion, right? So Zacchaeus was a tax collector, right? He was uh, notoriously known for, for taking probably more than he needed to take. And then there's a kind of, you see a shift in his demeanor. He's trying to see Christ. He wants to be, wants to get to see Jesus, right? And he says, I'm going to pay back everything beyond uh, what I did. And there's, there's a change. There's a heart condition change with Zacchaeus. So in the context of that, the disciples are with Jesus. They're nearing Jerusalem. Uh, this is going to be about the usage of money. And so there's a, there seems to be a misconception with the disciples, but also with the Pharisees, that, that Jesus' kingdom was going to appear immediately. So maybe not understanding fully what Jesus was there to do, that he was going to die, that he was going to ascend, that he was going to come back. So I think there was more of this, it's, it's, it's here. Maybe Jerusalem, Jerusalem is like the, the throne. And Jesus is getting ready, tangibly, visibly, to take the throne. So there seemed to be some misconception there. And then Jesus goes in to this parable. The parable of the ten minutes. So we have a nobleman, we have servant number one, we have servant number two, and we have servant number three. So those are going to be our primary figures for this, this story. And we'll start out with the nobleman because that's kind of the prominent figure mentioned in the beginning. So if you want to turn over to, to Luke chapter 19, I'm going to have the verses up on the screen. I'm going to break them down in, into different segments and we'll, we'll kind of work our way through it. But it, it actually begins in... See, I think it's verse 11 is where the parable begins. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and read verses uh, 11 through 13. While they were listening to this, he went on to tell them a parable, because he was near Jerusalem, and the people thought that the kingdom of God was going to appear at once. He said, A man of noble birth went to a distant country to have himself appointed king and then to return. So he called ten of his servants and gave them ten minutes. Put this money to work, he said, until I come back. Now, it doesn't specify how long he's going to be gone. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't necessarily say... Now, it says, put this money to work, so we'll unpack that. So he's a couple things, right? Man of noble birth, traveling to be appointed as king. So he has every intention of coming back. But before he goes, he delegates, or he goes, he pulls the servants toward him, and he says... Take this, right? So again, one minute would be three months' wages. Take them, put this money to work until I come back. Okay. So they're charged with what? They're charged with taking this money that they've been given, and they're to put it to work. So trade with it, be busy with it, increase it is the idea, right? Not to just hold on to it, right? They're supposed to put it to work and increase it. And he says, do this until I come back. So what would you expect him to say when he comes back? Where is it? <laughs> Where is it, right? So like he's, he's given them the task. So logically, right, like if, I, if my dad says, hey, cut these lawns, and he comes back, he's going to, how'd it go? Did you cut the lawns, right? And if I didn't cut the lawns, I, wouldn't, I would be embarrassed, right? I wouldn't want to have to tell him that. But I want you to watch how this parable unfolds. So verse 14, uh, can I get somebody else to read? So I'm not hogging all the time here? Okay. <clears throat> But his citizens hated him and sent a delegation after him, saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, he then commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so in verse 14, you see that his subjects hated him, and they sent a delegation, right? We don't want this man to be our king. Right, this is the guy that's about to go and be appointed king and come back as king. And you make a statement like that, right? So also kind of like, maybe choose your words carefully. So it says the man was made king, and he came back. So now he's officially a king, right? And he, sa and he sends for the servants right away, it sounds like, to whom he had given the money to find out what they had gained with it. Right? Now here's the reckoning time. Like, what, I charged you with this. What have you done? Okay. So... Verses 16 through 17. The first servant, first one came and said, Sir, your minna has earned ten more. Tenfold increase, right? Well done, my good servant, his master replied. Because you have been trustworthy in a very small matter, take charge of ten cities. 
right? So he, this first servant takes what he was given, turns it into 10 times the amount, and his master says, well done. You've been trustworthy. I've entrusted you with this. You've done what I've asked you to do. Small matter, now take charge of 10 cities. That sounds like a big reward, right? You've done, a, you've done good with the little that I gave you. Now take 10 cities, right? And it's, notice it's the same number, right? The corresponding 10s. Servant number one, well done. Yes? Hey, I'm really not trying to bog this down. No, go ahead. Uh, <clears throat> but at 14, it's, I can't, is that, it sounded like you went to go be the king and everyone said no. Or is that the people he gave the money to that? Said that was the, uh, the people that he, when he was, he left, right? The, the people that he, right? The servants yeah. that he had and he was going to be, and they said, we don't want him to be king. Huh. Like they had problems with him. Yeah, yeah. they were like, oh, he, we don't want well, him to be king. It doesn't sound king. like it changed but the, the narrative. Right. But then he comes back and now he is king. Okay. And now it's kind of like, All right, just want to make yeah, sure. yeah, does that make sense? Yep, yep. So they were frustrated, yeah. Servant number one. So I think we can kind of sum it up and say that it was good, right? There was an expectation from the master, right? And now the king. He said, I, I want you to do this, and he does. Verses 18, 19. Let's move on to that. All right, so the second came and said, Sir, your minute has earned five more. So not, a, not quite as impressive as the first, but still good, right? He still did something with it. And his master answered, you take charge of five cities. Okay, so they're both rewarded. Now, when you're looking at this parable, right, um, is, would it be fair to say that not all rewards are equal or that people are rewarded, maybe there's degrees of rewarding, right? Are these two rewards the same? No. 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 So they're, they're directly in correspondence with what they produced, right? So the, the one that turned it into 10, 10 cities. The one that turned it into five, which is still good, right? So degrees, so does this mean that there's degree of reward in heaven? If this is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning, as we like to say, what can we pull from that? So we'll come back to that. I wanna, leave, I wanna plant that in your mind for, for a moment. Servant number two. if I sent the wrong slides. I'm missing some things. Okay, that's all right, we'll be fine. I had some graphics that aren't showing up here. All right, so servant number two, right? He did, he did well also. So then we get to the third servant. It says, then another servant came and said, sir, here is your minna. I have kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. Right? In other words, I didn't do anything with it. I was afraid of you because you are a hard man you take out what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. Well, let's hold off on the response. So when you, when you notice what he says here, right? I've kept it laid away in a piece of cloth. So it's, it hasn't gained it. He hasn't turned it into anything. He didn't put it to work. And he says, I was afraid of you because you are a hard man. So how does he justify and does he successfully justify why he did nothing with what he was given? Yeah. Tyler. Fear. Sounds like the guy's locked up with fear. Okay. So he says, I was afraid of you. He says, you're a hard man. Okay. Was there anything um, in what the master charged them with that was unreasonable, do you think? Because he, he seems kind of burdened by it, right? Like, oh, you're, you're kind of a hard man. You, you take what you did not put in and reap what you did not sow. Like, we're doing all the work. You're giving us this to do. That sounds like a what? Bad attitude. Bad attitude. <laughs> sounds like an excuse to do nothing, right? We can, we can, we're really good at justifying. I'll be honest. I hate to, I hate to say this, but I really didn't want to go to camp this weekend. <laughs> I really didn't want to go. I struggled mentally with that. I knew that my kids wanted to go. But I didn't really want to go, and I was like, well, I can justify. It was a hard week. It's kind of expensive to go. I'm kind of tired. There's a, a blizzard outside. Like, there's a lot of things that I was like, yeah, this will be, yeah, it'll be all right. We'll just, we'll just do something fun at home. I could have easily justified it to myself. But there was fellowship at camp that was good that we would have missed out on. Uh, my kids would have been sad, right? I could deal with that, but they would have been sad. Um, <laughs> but I had, to, I had to put aside... And my wife was really good about reminding me, like, hey, you need to, you need to have a good, good attitude. 
And so I, I, was, I was grateful for that, but I, you know, I, I eventually came around, I'm like, yeah, this is, and I'm glad we went, it was fun. Um, but we can justify things really easily to ourselves, right? And it sounds like here, this was his, he's kind of turning it over onto the master. Instead of, you know, I didn't do what you asked me to do, he says, well, you're, you know, you burdened us with this. Like, you're a hard guy to deal with. You put this on us. And the response, his master replied, I will judge you by your own words, you wicked servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a hard man taking out what I did not put in and reaping what I did not sow? Why then didn't you put my money on deposit so that when I came back, I could have collected it with interest? Why don't you at least do that? And, I mean, that probably would be the equivalent of a mic drop in biblical times, right? There's not, there's not really much you could say, I don't think, in response to that. Not good. So, servant number three. Mm -mm. It was a very small amount of effort that would have right. a really tiny amount of effort. Right. Any effort. Right. And I also thought it was kind of funny that he talked that way to the king. Right. Pretty bold, I, I thought, when I was reading it. Like, he's, you're turning it on him now after you didn't just, I mean, even, even like he said, put it on deposit so that it will, it will gain something. And nope, I'd put it in this cloth. Not a good scenario, right? So, um, so as it continues, right, we saw that the first two servants were rewarded, right? But rewarded differently based on what they had done. So then we get to the conclusion here, and he says in verse 24, Then he said to those standing by, Take his minna away from him, and give it to the one who has ten minutes. <coughs> Sir, they said, he already has ten. <coughs> he replied, I tell you that to everyone who has, more will be given. But as for the one who has nothing, even what they have will be taken away. But those enemies of mine who did not want me to be king over them, bring them here and kill them in front of me. Wow, that really, that really gets, to the, uh, gets to the point real fast at the end, right? So you can see that there's this, this parable at first glance, right? You've got kind of an obedience idea, disobedience. You've got kind of a being proactive, being inactive or lazy. You've got a couple like basic things you can see. You've got rewards versus punishment. So if we look at this a little closer, Right? If we go back to servant number three, and we already kind of talked about this, how does he justify his inactivity? Right? How do we justify not using the talents that we have? Right? First of all, we have to recognize what they are. But once we do know, what are we supposed to do with them? Use them. Share them. Put them, put them to work. Right? Not to, to not waste them. Um, there are a lot of times in life where we are charged with tasks that we legitimately don't want to do. And it's really easy to convince yourself to sit it out. And I have, that's something that I have um, had to wrestle with, and I think all of us on some level go through that. Like, I don't really want to do this, but I know that I need to do it. It's going to be uplifting to someone else if I do. And it's going to draw me closer to God if I do it. Um, and I think those are the kind of thoughts that, like, when you read a parable like this, and you see, here, I'm leaving this in your charge. What are you going to do? <coughs> the third servant missed it. Here's what he says again, just to go back to it. I was afraid of you because you're a hard man. I love how he turns it on him. So what can we make of this parable? Right? Any, any thoughts before I move into the the last couple things here. Thoughts that you had when you read it? I think another way that the third servant could have said, <clears throat> I'm just thinking of not, I'm not thinking in parable terms, but it, let's say a boss, right, and you underperformed. Uh, maybe I've been there before. But <laughs> it's, instead of saying, You're, this company's nuts, you can say, uh, I blew it. I got spooked, I was nervous, and I handled it poorly. And that is at least different than saying, I did this action all wrong, and it's because of you and what I think of you. Those are, those are two different. Mm -hmm. I was shocked that, I mean, that's a lot of 
that's a lot of uh, not hatred, but uh, disdain for mm -hmm. for for this for the role that he had for the role he was given. Mm -hmm. He said, "I want nothing to do with this." So I, I don't want to say anything. So are we going to get into the spiritual aspect? Yep. Okay, because I don't want to say anything. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to do you want to start it, or I can I can just go? <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I was just making sure because <laughs> yeah. As we jump into the the, the spiritual, then mm -hmm. it answers all these questions. Yeah. So what do we make of this, right? So there seems to be some context here, right, that not all the rewards are going to be the same. Right? If you looked at what was given, we, we talked about how they're different. Um, the third one actually has his, his meta taken from him and given to someone else. So if you're, if you're breaking down what's happening in the story, right, who, who would be a good example maybe of the ruler? Right? What would the ruler be representative, or whom would the ruler represent in this parable? He would represent Christ. Okay. Yeah. And so Christ, uh, how did the Jews feel about Christ as being God's son, uh, being our means of salvation, his, his kingdom? How was Jesus viewed? Was everybody all in right away no. when Jesus came? Yeah, they, 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 they still... The resistance. Right. They rejected him. Definitely they did. So how was Christ's power viewed by the Jews? My question is, can, you, can, we, can we want to have Christ's saving power, right, save us, but at the same time be unwilling to submit to his authority? No. How can those two things be? Right. And isn't that not kind of what the Jews, the frame of mind that was on display, right? That we want the convenience of, yeah, we want but we don't want to acknowledge as this, right? Do you have a hand up? No? Yeah. Didn't. Well, part of it, when he's, when he's talking about giving them a charge, it's like what he tells us to do, to go. And to go. And preach the word. Mm -hmm. And that's what he, in the parable, I think that's what mm -hmm. he's trying to tell them. Like, yeah, I have there's to work to be job. done, yes, right? And when I come back, I'm yep. going gonna, gonna to... Exactly. The disciples had a, had a job to do. There was work to be done. The word was to be spread, the message of Christ. Uh, there was that, we talked about that misunderstanding of Jesus. Like, right now, everything's going to be, and he's like, I'm going to go away for a while, and when I come back, right, while I'm gone, there's work for you to do. And I'm expecting that you're going to take care of it. Right? And in like manner, we're charged also with spreading the gospel. Right? There's a lot of people that are uh, have no clue. There are a lot of people that are searching on everything in between, and, and that's something that uh, should fill us with a sense of urgency, that, that those opportunities that, that we need to be doing that, we need to be looking for them, that a lot of times they're there, as I always like to say. That, and if you're looking for them, that you'll find them. Um, but when you think about a parable, right, there's the surface level, and then there's like the spiritual or the, or the deeper meaning behind it, right? And so at first glance, it's a story about a master that puts in his servants in charge of taking care of this money, right? But in the context of the passage, Jesus is telling this in response to the misconception that the disciples had, too. They didn't maybe fully understand what he was about to do and what it was going to cost and where he was going to go and what he was going to endure. And that's where you see this parallel unfolding. So we, we can't want the convenience of Christ but be unwilling to submit to his authority. David? Yeah, I was just going to say, as you look at 2, verse 12 there, um, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom. That seems like to be a strange idea, right? Mm -hmm. That you're going somewhere else to be appointed, but keeping right. it in line with Christ, right? right. Uh, we also know that, remember, during the times of Christ, you had the Herods, right? Right. And so the Herods, you know, governors, they like to be called kings, they actually were appointed by who? By Rome. So they went away to be appointed given the authority and then go back, back right and yeah. then the Jews didn't want them to be king or ruler over mm -hmm. them and so then you, then you apply that so you can see that arch that there parallels one, there uh, yeah there was one Archelaus, uh, Arche Archelaus I think his name was uh, where he was actually appointed by Augustus and then the Jews actually sent a delegation to Augustus to protest uh, them you know him being in charge so you can see how Jesus is using a little bit of the history using the yeah it parallels uh, the yeah the history so then the citizens, or, or like the actual servants become, as far as Christ is the nobleman, the servant, servants become 
the, the disciples, right? The disciples of right. Christ. Disciples of Christ are the representative of the servants. So we've been given a task. We've been given minna, right? Mm -hmm. and we're supposed to increase that. We've been given the word of God. Mm -hmm. and so that's how the, you know, this can yeah. to play itself out. And so do we, right? Do we, do we take what's been given us and do we make use of it? Hopefully we do. So I wanted to finish up with a couple more verses. I wanted us to look at Acts 4. And if you'd like to turn over there, we're going to look at 8 through 12. So I, w I wanted to kind of set this up for you. So I'm going to turn over there as well. I'll have it on the screen also, but it might be kind of, kind of small. All right. Okay, so in this, in this uh, passage, right, Peter and John are standing before the Sanhedrin, uh, and then there's the, there's the idea here about this, uh, this man being lame and being, and being healed, right? So I'm going to read this for you, and so I want you to notice what, what Peter says in response to this. Filled with the Holy Spirit, or then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today... For an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame, and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel, it is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. Right. Acknowledging Jesus as Lord. Uh, the last verse, uh, I don't have this one on the screen, so if somebody could turn over to Psalm 2, we'll look at verses 1 through 8. Whenever someone has it, we can go ahead and read it. Uh, one through eight, please. Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. Then the one enthroned in heaven laughs. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them with his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will pro proclaim the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son today. I have become your father. Ask me, and I will make the nations your inheritance and the ends of the earth your possession. Nope, that's good. Thank you. So again, there's, um, there's rewards and there's punishment to be had. We're expected to, to use what we've been given. We see this illustrated by the, the parable of the minas, but we, uh, just like the disciples were charged with spreading the word, we are too. And um, obviously our, our goal is to please our Father, it's to make it into heaven. Uh, we're, we're given this charge and we need to take it seriously. Um, I, don't, I don't like thinking about how I'm going to feel if I have to tell someone I've disappointed them. And a lot of times that, that motivates me. Like if my boss says, hey, I need you to do this, and maybe I really don't want to do it, I don't want to have to stand before him. And then when he asks me about it, to, that, that's a bad feeling. That's a pit in your stomach feeling. Um, and if that bothers us, right, how do we feel about our Heavenly Father? Right? What he's charged us with doing, what he expects of us, right? Are we, are we using our talents? Um, that's all I have for tonight. I was, I'm going to end a little bit early unless someone else has a comment. Yeah, Judy. Um, I think w when you had mentioned before how, um, how we can turn this around instead of taking our talents and doing mm -hmm. things, <coughs> accomplishing, which our big goal is to uh, spread the word, mm -hmm. convert people, help them to find the truth. But then if we turn around and say, well, I'm just not talented enough, or I don't know enough, or I'm not good enough, or, you know, then we're, it's almost like spitting in God's face with everything that he's given us and does create in us and, and um, uh, the talents that we do have. But, you know, every one of us here is able to speak and tell a story. Mm -hmm. So we can do that. Mm -hmm. But then we say, 
you know, I'm just not good enough or I'm, you know, I'm not able. And I'm, I don't have a lot of ego, but I know that I should be able to tell why I'm saved and why I'm going to heaven and what, how I feel about that. And so, Absolutely. you know, when we try to use our inability as an excuse, that's a really sad thing. It's going to be a problem with that. Uh, Tyler, then Dave. Oh, uh, well, maybe Dave. Can help me. <laughs> I'm looking for that verse where Jesus is like, uh, they're like, hey, what are you talking about? We we knew you. And he's like, you didn't feed the help, the homeless. And, uh, anybody know, anyone know that verse off the top of their heads? Matthew, Matthew, Matthew 25. Uh -huh. Matthew, Matthew what? I knew it was Matthew. Matthew chapter 25. <laughs> Matthew 25. Because that, that's yeah. coming to mind mm -hmm. when I think about our talents and what we can do. Yeah. Certainly spread the word. And certainly some people feel like they got the Bible memorized, like David over here. <laughs> and I, in the opposite, I heard some of these stories. I could barely clip them together some days. But but there's things to do other than just have this attitude that I don't have these, I don't have the the abilities to do these things. There, there's more than just spread the word by yeah, the absolutely. door knock or throw a Bible. Yeah. 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 yeah so you just, you know, as you kind of look at the end of this, you know, so you have the, the multiple service. So you look at the double men, you have Christ, right? Mm -hmm. Christ had 12 disciples, <laughs> disciples, right? But then he also had, you know, all the, he had the apostles, but then he had all the disciples, right? 120 in the upper room, Acts chapter 1. What, what was the charge that he gave them? So the charge that he gave them was to take the message out into the world, right? Mm -hmm. And so right. the minas re the minas actually re are representative of the word of God and how well that they've done. And so to who uh, much is given, much, you know, uh, will be expected, right? Mm -hmm. You think about the apostle uh, Peter, right? And, you know, how he added thousands to the kingdom. And then the apostle Paul, he added thousands to the kingdom, right? Mm -hmm. But then you had that other servant, that third servant. Those were the ones to where some of the ones, like maybe like a Judas, right, who had the same training, had the three years of ministry training, and yet he did nothing with the, with the abilities that the Lord had given him, right? He, he basically hid his talent, so to speak. But that would be equivalent to any of us who have been really tasked with one thing, and yet we don't do the one thing that we've been tasked for. And then you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10. We look at here in, in uh, Luke 19 and how he, we said, whoa, you know, uh, bring them before me and kill them. And we're like, whoa. Well, 2 Corinthians 5 and 10 talks about, you know, when us as disciples come before Christ in judgment, and we didn't do the very simple thing that he gave us to do, which was, he didn't say you had to get tenfold or fivefold. Mm -mm. No. He just gave us right. what was what was the charge was right. and expected us to do something. Mm -hmm. And so when we don't do anything, then we can expect what he's, uh, that servant would have received, and that would have been death, right? Yeah. And so you can see the seriousness. And then just lastly, yeah. you know, this is, you know, this is like literally leading up to now, we go into the next chapter, you have the triumphal entry. So this is the last week of Christ. Of Christ, So yeah. you look at the prodigal son, you look at the lost sheep, you look mm -hmm. at, you know, you know, repentance, you look at Zacchaeus, the salvation coming to his house. Well, it was only coming to his house because this was a man who realized the error of his ways, mm -hmm. turned his life around, repented, and then decided to give half of his wealth to the poor. So you can see how Jesus said salvation came to this house. And so, you know, you get, as you get to this last week of his life, Jesus is trying to really make it known, you know, what's expected of his servants, right. being that he's about to be the king of the new kingdom that's coming in the coming, well, weeks. So. Yeah, needed to, needed to clear some things up, right? Because it was, it was clear that they didn't fully grasp what it was going to be. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate that. Yeah, so uh, one of the big themes there, too, is, is, the, is the idea of, of change, too, and repentance as we, as we got to the prodigal son. Right? That, that need, we talked about that last night in the uh, elders class, right? That, that repent means to change, right? To go in the opposite direction. That's, that's what we saw with the prodigal son. So I, I'm hoping that studying these parables, um, you know, I had to go back and I was like, wow, this is very similar to the parable of the talents, right, in Matthew. And they, they really are similar. And it's nice to go back through these and, and pull out, uh, not only to look at the surface, but to look at that behind the, um, or the, that secondary meaning or that spiritual meaning. That's really the point of why the parables are told, right? To, make, to take something that's very common and familiar and understandable and then apply it to the spiritual meaning, right? Here's what you need to learn from this. So uh, it's, it was really, it's been great to look at these. I don't know who's next, Jim. Do you know who's on the schedule next? David's next. Okay. 
So what is what is your uh, what is your topic for next week? Uh, lamp lampstand next week. Lampstand. And I can't remember the next okay. Week. There were actually two lists that I saw that Russ sent, and so I checked them, and they were different because I had two different things for tonight. So I I had to do some some digging and figure it out, but I think I, I think I got it right. So thank you guys for being here. Let's let's close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to have class, and we're thankful for uh, the hearts of those here, and that we're willing to dive in and look at these things, and we're thankful that we have the Bible as our guide, and that you've preserved it for us, and that we can uh, see by example and command what the, what the first century Christians did, and we can make application, and we know that you are unchanging, Father. It's societies and culture that changes, but you are unchanging. We're thankful for your word and the authority of it, and may we always view it as such. We thank you for your son, Jesus. We pray that you'll be with each, each of us this evening as we depart. You'll keep us safe. And we look forward to meeting again on Sunday. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Dan.